My dearest Emily, my time for renewal has finally arrived, and I have thus set out into this new wild. I aim to seek a land where nature will lavish her choicest gifts upon me, where sickness hath no dwelling place, and where my toil will be amply rewarded. I see this as the dawn of a new life for me, a rebirth from the trappings and miasms of society. It is my final chance to explore both myself and the world around me. And I must say that I am so very comforted by the thought of your eyes soaking up my rambling words. It is sincerely my belief that our continued correspondence will encourage me to seek out the truths that have scattered themselves across the span of time. A time which flows like that of a wild river. Much more weary in these past months, and my ailments continue to elevate in discomfort to a level in which my constitution can no longer bear. In a recent moment of serendipity, I conversed with a gentleman upon his return from the wild north. He proclaimed that a few days spent among the brooks, rivers, and lakes of this bracing climate had rendered him quite robust and healthy. He recommends such an excursion to many an invalid as far superior to quack medicines and expensive nostrums. I now plan to seek out and settle in a climb as he described, praying for the similar transformative effect to bestow itself upon me. I've heard that pine emits an odor peculiarly healing and highly beneficial for invalids. These recent months living in God's great land confirms this thesis as my consumptive ailments have been healed, rendering me a new man. There is no place perhaps on this globe where nature displays such diversified lands and water. The banks are high and afford a series of picturesque views. The shores are rugged and steep interrupted by lovely, sheltering covers. The shallows are plentiful. I have felt as if invited to settle down and admire their resplendent views with a sort of joyful thankfulness for having been led to them. But just as I am in awe of the beauty, I am also interested in the potential to employ its power to make a better life for myself. I have concluded that the only way to investigate more wonderment is to strike out and explore the vast realm that lies beyond my door.
to the governor of the territory. With this letter being unofficial and private, I may with safety give you a more extensive view of our policy respecting the Indians. In order to promote this disposition to exchange lands, which they have to spare and we want, we shall push our trading uses. We will be glad to see the good and influential individuals among them run in debt. Because we observe that when these debts get beyond what the individuals can pay, they become willing to lop them off by a cession of lands. In this way, our settlements will gradually circumscribe and approach the Indians, and they will in time either incorporate with us as citizens of the United States, or a move beyond the Mississippi. President Thomas Jefferson, 1803. Nindugama Kandagaman, Nimbama is a Mananig, Oao is a Wave is a Yang, Anishana, a King Migawewen, Gapana. Mish Adawe Winawanag, Minawa, Giti Mukomanag, Azagwa, Oma, Gaskatuwad, Anje is a Chigayang, Minawend, Ego, Ao, Akin. Geget Sah Onzam, Manumin, Minawa, Amakuwayanan, Nindasinganan, Je Isse, Minigoyang, Inu, Mayage, Apachaganan, Nishke, Inu, Bash Kizaganan, Iwapiko, Apachaganan, Minawa, Ishkodawabu, Nindi, Minigoman, Gosha, Minawin. Ningiti aya imanani o ao o dun wachige wina minawani ningiti nigez in endaman ginwens nina win bunindamang mi ga ayang wa mingwang wa kiti nibowa kiti mukomana chigi pis anet i ikadowag agawe kiti aya ik gimama gunamani kiti mukomana giwe aki ginawin je minagoyang kiti manadun nima migwe wajikwe 1827 I've overheard that the Northwest Company has brought 56 kegs of alcohol for trade with the savages this year. With my 8 kegs from the XY Company, we should have enough between us to trade more than 7 gallons of liquor for every single adult Sioux and Chippewa in the entire river valley. This will indeed be a very good year of trading for us, as this additional lubricant will help us pass last year's record of the savages harvesting over 8,000 beaver pelts for us. Michel Curot, 1805 Agu gichi moku manag, wenji we dege manang, agu ashkenawig, gichi da git barzi wag, wewib igu, ije bonin danawad, wiganesh iu, Ogi kino amago winama wenin inu kichi aya aminanin waya benda ikwad api dash ki wenji a niboa inu ogi kino amago winan dawin gida hiji nasimen geget sa the wana miwag igu hojbweg minawa gawin awia oga ki keni masiwan wenesh in a way mawad winawa mi dash zagaswe edi winan wag iu ojis kade manan bisho iu Chibikong, Gigagi ge ishi atawe igewad. Gichi weishkin, eighteen twenty.
This has been a most prosperous season of bounty, as game was everywhere. Thus far, I've killed 79 deer, 16 elk, and 3 bears. I've also caught more trout than I can count, with the aid of both hooks and large scoop nets. Even with these blessings, I'm still unable to grasp how untamed and rich the world is, spontaneously abundant with all the necessaries of life. I reckon that with a bit of cultivation, it might be made to produce even the luxuries of life. There is opportunity for all men to prosper, and seemingly no end to what one may need or want of this world. The only challenge I foresee is how to provide all of God's chosen people with the opportunity to delight in this new Canaan, this promised land. We signed treaty in 1837 to share our land with the white man. We said that when our grandchildren grows old, we will once again return to this land. But now the great father beyond the mountains forbids us to even hunt or fish on these lands. We now depend on the whites for food and clothing more than ever before. The wild rice, elk, and beaver are gone, replaced by gunshots, disease, and the Shkote Nabiguan, those monstrous fire vessels belching up smoke on the river. Naganab, 1863. traveling up the river on the stern wheeler of considerable prowess. It has been so exciting to experience nature without a worry for pesky bugs or animal attacks. Yesterday, from the safety and comfort of our boat, we were lucky enough to see savages, just as the captain said we might. We were amused by the pranks of the half-naked Indian children who ran into the waves raised by the steamboat wheels, flinging water about with exulting shouts while a hard-featured savage with a yell as of defiance shot his canoe directly across the channel before the boat. What an authentic wilderness experience I've had thus far in this northern territory. Elizabeth Ellett 1853. What a pleasurable time me and the boys have had this week on the river. 
Our steamer captain promised a braggart's bounty of fish and fowl, and he has delivered on his promise tenfold. Immediately after the Enterprise departed shore, we constructed a bulkhead around the forward guards of lower deck, a precaution rendered necessary for us to shoot waterfowl unobserved. After more than 30 brace of geese were expunged, we turned our sights to the sky overhead, which hung heavy with a thick flock of passenger pigeons. I fired my double barrel into a flock and brought down 52 pigeons at once, which must be a local record of sorts. Ebenezer Ayers, 1862. My boat is usually a smart and lively little craft that can run like a scared owl over a dry sandbar. But this trip has struck us on bars a dozen times thus far. These unavoidable detentions, on account of the low stage of water, floating logs from lumber companies, and heavy freight, each involve a delay of several hours. The slow working over a formidable sandbar when one's time is precious is about as severe a test of patience as could well be devised. Now and then, all hands had to leap ashore and cut down wood from the shore to feed the engine while the Knapp thus labored along. Oscar F. Knapp, Captain of the G.B. Knapp, 1867. I recently came across an astute political essay by a Mr. John O'Sullivan, a portion of which I've copied down for reflection. Quote, and that claim is by the right of our manifest destiny to overspread and to possess the whole of the continent which Providence has given us for the development of the great experiment of liberty and federated self-government entrusted to us. End quote. And how right he is. This land, our land, is indeed a great experiment in freedom. I've discovered that with the abundance of resources in our world, many have found a way to possess it, but only the smartest of men have discovered how to prosper from it. The potential riches of this land are bound only by one's motivation, creativity, and rapaciousness.
barely made it through the year on our newstead. If it were not for the hunting, fishing, and sugar mapling, we would have surely starved by now. My husband is forced to work in the logging camp during the winter months to make ends meet, while I stay back to tend the homestead alone. With the camp nearly a 10 mile walk away, he is only able to be home for a few hours every Saturday evening before returning to camp on Sunday morning. Why must I share my husband with a lumber baron, a scoundrel who takes his labor but returns but a fraction of its profit? Christina Nielsen, 1879. I do not believe the government flyers, as there is no royal road to farming in this new land. The towering pines have been leveled by the woodman's axe, leaving nothing but stumps strewn fields on the cutaway, which constantly flood from the dams and log drives on the river. My final attempt will be with cranberries on my 160 acres. If I cannot drain and reclaim the swamp pads as profitable cranberry marshes, we will need to abandon our homestead before another long winter arrives. Carl Nielsen, 1882. Now that my syndicate owns the boom site and we have finished construction on the dam, I finally have complete control of this goddamn river as not a single log or steamboat will move on it without paying to pass through my choke points. With the full command at the start and the end of the line, I am confident we will best last year's record of 200 million board feet harvested from the valley, and I can finally call this my river of pine. Frederick Weyerhauser, 1890. Rivers get more dangerous every year for river pig, especially since that new boss logger took over the boom. He wants the soys to bring down a hundred pound per day between the two of them on a crosscut, so I've seen some of the jammedest jams I ever saw. Heck, just last week, I was riding a drive down river when an overhanging branch took me off my log and I fell head first into the river. Before I could right myself and get a breath, some half dozen logs ran over me. I'd have been a goner if it weren't for the current spitting into the shallows. I swear, it took two days of eating hot pork and beans just to warm myself back up again. James Johnston, 1889. The business of nature has been a magnificent one. It has enriched many. It has furnished and is still furnishing a means of livelihood for thousands. The ability to control and profit from nature is a power akin to that of a god. One can utilize or invent new technology that has the ability to change the course of evolution itself. We truly do have the power to begin the world over again and again. While at first it seemed worrisome to wield such power, it has now become a way of life. It seems there is no end to what we can do now, thanks to the technology that lies at the very tips of our fingers.
I've been hearing more and more that our farming and fertilizing is to blame for the river water being murky, covered with so-called toxic algae bloom. But my farm is 20 miles from the river. The feds have been pushing agriculture policies on us for years, expecting us to maximize production, and never once have they mentioned river pollution so in addition to trying to hit maximum yields, I'm expected to clean up my farm on my own dime. Leaf Larson, 2005. I became a ranger because I love this waterway, and I want future generations to enjoy it as I have. But every year there seems to be more excess and abuse on this river, to a point where we as a unit can no longer control it. If we're not trying to educate people about overfishing and enforce the laws when people ignore them, we're dealing with drunken weekend partiers and the noise pollution caused by their massive boats. We also have to deal with farm fertilizer runoff and a zebra mussel infestation. This has become more than a full-time job. It's now a tiresome battle that seems like it will never end. Ingrid Ellingson, 2012. My dad just bought a 26-foot cruiser with a 600-horsepower engine, and I'm so stoked to take it out on the river this weekend. But it really sucks that there are, like, so many people enforcing stupid things like no-wake zones. And what the hell is a zebra mussel? All I want to do is hang out with my bros on the river and drink a few beers. Why can't I just get out on the river and experience nature like a real American outdoorsman? Freedom mate, what he used to be, bruh. Jeff Olson, 2016. Most of those who have lived their lives beside the placid stream recall best the, the quiet times of canoes and tiny flat-bottomed craft with minnow buckets trailing behind. Today, the valley is filled with the ear-splitting staccato of high-powered speedboats. I long for the days of sandbars and low water, for they might provide protection against the noisy and dangerous onslaught of an ever-increasing flotilla of modern speedboats and daredevil water skiers. James Taylor Dunn, 1965. The control of mankind reaches beyond anything I'd ever imagined possible. As the world evolves into a more advanced era, full of new technology, we have been able to harness the power of nature to unfathomable levels. Although at times we might stray from the path of control, we are able to right that path through a combination of our own volition and the masterful guidance of our God. The future looks bright, for as long as we stay one step ahead of nature, we can easily circumnavigate the potential for chaos.
The monster we've created has gotten too big for us to control, and all hope is most likely lost. What filled us with such hubris to think we could play God? I yearn to go back to the beginning of it all, to start over, as I now realize that to have no control of the world is to be truly free. I bring you beauty from the river, shadowy hills in a rising mist, pine trees standing high and the river flowing, flowing, flows forever by. I bring you beauty from the river, where leaves a golden carpet lie. There are no smoky buildings here to shut away the morning sky. Just shadowy hills in a rising mist, and pine trees standing high. <laughs> 